Hello everyone, uh, I'm Bobin from Polygon and today I'm here with Joe from Anoma and we're doing uh, another recording of the ZK Whiteboard series. And today our topic is multi-asset shielded pools. So uh, Joe, uh, what are multi-asset shielded pools and why do we need them? Thanks for having me. So a multi-asset shielded pool is, is exactly as the name suggests. It's a shielded pool that can contain multiple assets. Now, what is a shielded pool? Well, shielded pool is popularized by Zcash, or the original zero coin paper. And the idea of a shielded pool is that instead of having the sender, receiver, and value all publicly uh, listed on the blockchain as is um, with, with uh, most transparent blockchains, the idea is that a shielded pool is a privacy layer that allows um, transactions to be encrypted, in a sense, so that um, they're not broadcast to the entire world. So if you and I are using a shielded pool, then uh, nobody from the outside can figure out you know, who sent money to whom or how much, the, how big the amount was and all of that stuff, right? At least uh, you've broken the cryptographic link between um, uh, each transaction. Okay. Uh, and so one of the uh, uh, things that is true of Zcash is that it supports only a single asset only. At least at this time, which is ZEC, right? And the idea of um, when you have a shielded pool with a single asset, um, every transaction in the shielded pool is transferring the same exact asset. And so it's obvious, at least from the outside, um, even though the uh, sender, receiver, and value may be encrypted, um, the asset type is not in question because everyone knows that this uh, transaction within the shielded pool uh, must be the single asset. And so our goal of the multi-asset shielded pool is to allow many asset types within a single shielded pool so that for a given transaction uh, is not possible to tell from the outside. At least uh, there's no cryptographic evidence of what the um, uh, asset in that transaction is. I guess before we go into the multi-asset, uh, could you maybe explain in, at high level, like how does a single asset shielded pool work? Right, so the zero coin uh, and Zcash model is essentially how um, uh, most or all shielded pools today uh, operate. And the idea is that we have a note set, um, which is a Merkle tree of all uh, transaction outputs ever recorded in the pool. So this is similar to how Bitcoin has a UTXO set, except that um, in this case we make a slight difference where uh, note set is actually um, every transaction output, whether they're spent or unspent. Yep. Right, and so then from this note set, um, we can use zero knowledge proofs to uh, show several things about the transaction. So if you start with this Merkle tree, and each note looks uh, something like some value of some value of the note and uh, the owner, and the owner address, which is typically a public key, then what you can do is if you want to spend a note, use a ZK snark or similar, some kind of uh, zero knowledge uh, proof or argument or uh, something like that to show that one, the note is unspent, as it hasn't been spent already, two, the owner has authorized which uh, in the case of the owner address is a public key, there's a signature involved or something like a signature. And three, 
the transaction, the value of the notes spent is equal to the value of the notes created. So sum of inputs is equal to sum of outputs. Exactly. Yep. So that therefore you cannot, you know, just create value out of nowhere magically, right? And in the single asset case, this is uh, relatively straightforward, right? You just sum up all of the values of uh, the notes that are spent in the transaction and you sum up all the value of the notes that are created and check that they're equal. Yep. And that happens within the ZK snark. And you circuit. check all of this inside of the ZK snark. And then you take the notes that are created and then you add them back into the Merkle tree of, of the note set. And so uh, the more transactions that there are, the larger this note set becomes. And because uh, each note in the note set, um, although it contains the encrypted value and owner address, it's, uh, or, or more precisely, it's a commitment, um, each note in the note set doesn't reveal any information about um, to the public what uh, the value of the owner is. And so as the note set grows, uh, you get more and more and more privacy. And I guess uh, maybe this is part, but like, why can't, like, we have multiple assets. We want to have this, uh, you know, some privacy guarantees. Why can't we just create a um, single uh, asset pool for each asset that we care about? Right. So um, this is not such a major problem for uh, if you have a couple pop, uh, different popular assets. Uh, so like assets that um, have many transactions, tokens that have many transactions. Um, then the privacy sets for each of those might be uh, large enough already. And you might get more privacy by, uh, by merging them together into one shielded pool. But the real advantage is when you have assets um, that are wildly different popularities. If you have a very uh, common asset that is transferred a lot, and then you have an, uh, some other assets that are very rarely uh, transferred, or even uh, something like an NFT, which uh, uh, there is only one of and uh, is only transferred um, you know, when, when that NFT is transferred, uh, you know it's transferred, and so it doesn't put much use to put it in its own shielded pool. And so the real advantage of a multi-asset shielded pool is putting them all in the same shielded pool and getting uh, all of these different tokens to share the same privacy set. So basically, even infrequently traded or transferred assets get the same kind of, or the same guarantees of anonymity and privacy as the most frequently traded asset, basically. Right, because yeah. even, if, even if some token is traded only once per day uh, and it's in the same shielded pool as a token yeah. that's traded a million times per day, uh, they're still cryptographically um, indistinguishable from the outside. Makes sense, makes sense. All right, so I think the motivation is clear, but um, what are the challenges of creating this um, multi-asset shielded pools? Right. So. So what are the challenges when we try and add uh, multiple asset types into one shielded pool? Well, for one, um, we don't want to hard code assets. So no hard coded. Because uh, for one, it's uh, probably impossible to, to make a list of all the assets that you would want to be able to put in the, sh in the shielded pool. But second, it's also not uh, very practical um, if to, to hard code a long uh, list into uh, the ZK SNARK circuit. And, and so um, we, we want to have some kind of protocol which is um, agnostic to, to how many assets uh, might be in the shielded pool or uh, even if some of those assets uh, may not exist yet. Uh, yeah. We want to support assets which, which uh, so we want to be able later. to create assets dynamically almost. Right, there yeah. should be uh, some way to um, uh, create uh, new assets and uh, uh, put them in or take them out of the shield pool in, in, in some standardized way. And so the second uh, challenge is that uh, oftentimes there's different standards Um, for example, um, value, sometimes this is a U64, sometimes this is a U128, 
Yeah. Um, and, and so um, if you are putting di different, uh, dif uh, different assets that um, follow different standards into the same field of pool, uh, sometimes you have to address um, how they uh, technically look different. Yep. Right. Another challenge is fee payment, um, which is when you have um, multiple uh, asset types in the same shielded pool, um, if you have a transaction with one asset type, uh, it might not be the native token of the chain or something like that. Um, and so uh, how do you uh, negotiate the fee payment for this um, transaction? Because um, you either have to maybe have the native token of the chain or you um, have some kind of mechanism where you unshield some of the other assets to pay the fees, but then you're revealing what the asset was in the transaction. And so um, there's some challenges in terms of how you um, uh, allow fee payment. And then um, you mentioned native token, but I guess in the context of like a multi-asset world, do we even need a native token or can we just say all assets are equal? Or because of the fee payment aspect, you do want to have a native token, for example. Right, it comes down uh, often to the, just the uh, economics of the chain, okay. um, where um, the, the chain might have um, some, some uh, native token, which all fee payments must be in. Uh, maybe the chain doesn't have any requirement for fee payments at all. Um, maybe uh, the chain allows payment in different asset types, and the, uh, the miners or validators have some mechanism for, for valuing these, these tokens. Um, maybe there's some mechanism where inside of the shielded pool, um, the non-native assets can be swapped for the native assets. There's lots of different ways you can approach this problem, uh, but uh, it's a unique problem because uh, you, you have to, uh, if, if you have fee payments of some kind that are required and uh, you're unshielding some of the transferred asset, you might leak some of the pri uh, privacy. Right. 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 Um, and uh, the last uh, challenge, which I'll mention, is uh, heterogeneous transactions, which is that um, you may have in a transaction, uh, a single transaction, multiple asset types. And this is something that cannot happen in a uh, single asset shielded pool um, because, uh, well, every, um, every transfer in, uh, in a transaction is going to be the same asset, and so you don't have um, to, to keep track of this. But if you have um, multiple assets allowed, then you might have complex transactions where you're sending uh, more than one asset type uh, within a transaction. You might want to allow this. Um, what, what are the benefits of like being able to have the same assets in the, uh, or different assets in the same transaction? Well, uh, for one, you don't have to uh, split it across multiple uh, transactions. So if you want to make sure that your transaction is atomic, for example, you definitely don't want to send uh, one token first and then send the second token because one of those two transactions may not execute. Yep. Um, you might want to have complex transactions with multiple signers, multiple parties. But um, this is a situation that you uh, maybe come across less commonly in a single asset shielded pool um, because it's less likely that someone would uh, want to atomically send uh, the same asset yeah. as someone else. But it, say if you and I are swapping a token privately, we might want to uh, construct a multi-party transaction where I send the token to you, you send the token to me, and they're different types, and um, you know, we're doing some th this kind of swap. There's no exchange, in, uh, a decentralized exchange involved. We're just swapping the assets, and we want to do this atomically. So, so none of us can, neither of us can back out of the trade. Uh, okay, uh, I think that's pretty cool actually that we can swap, like we basically can exchange assets without involving an exchange and do it fully privately. <laughs> right, Yeah. and so you, you get these questions that, that um, d don't come up so much in the single asset uh, yeah. shielded pool of, of like how do you handle if you have multiple signers or this yep. kind of thing, right? And so, um, you know, but, but we can start um, from the single asset shielded pool model, and we can start to address these challenges. All right. And the most simple uh, thing we can do is just add another field to each node, asset type. So um, 
maybe not describing exactly the form that this uh, field takes, but we have some representation of each asset type. Um, it can depend maybe on where the, the assets are from, if there's some kind of ERC token or if they're a Cosmos token or, or something like that, yep. then um, they all have some kind of representation um, for what their asset type is and you want to encode it somehow and put it in the node. Makes sense. Right. And so if we, act, if we do this, this is conceptually simple, but um, we, we do have to, to uh, make some changes to the, the rest of the protocol, right? Because here, where we said that the um, sum of all the values of the notes that are spent uh, has to equal the sum of all the values of the notes that are created. And when we do this in the multi-asset case, um, we don't just have to sum all the values uh, of all the notes together. We have to sum uh, a, for each asset type independently. So for each asset type, we have to sum all of the value of those notes of that asset type and check that it's equal to the value, uh, the sum of the values of all the notes of that asset and type. I guess that complicates the circuit quite a bit if you want to do that. Uh, it could, yes. So there's several different ways that we can um, implement this, this uh, step uh, in the ZK snark of, of checking that the value balance is correct, uh, that you're not creating any value. So let's consider some of the different ways that you could do it. So, um, so I'll just call it the uh, value balance check. So how do you check that the transaction uh, has, has a correct value balance? Well, one way of doing it is to uh, check the sum in the circuit. So the circuit inputs many notes and then um, some, some spent. So say two uh, spent notes and then two output notes. Though again, in the multi-asset case, you, might, uh, you, you may need more. Um, this is the way that zero coin worked, the Zcash Sprout protocol, um, where you uh, had a single circuit that checked all of the input notes and all of the output notes and uh, all of the created notes and uh, checked the inside of the circuit that the value sum. I guess in multi-asset situation, like if you have many assets, like your circuit needs to be, I guess, generic enough to be able to determine, like I might have 10 assets in, as part of one node and like 12 assets in another node or something like that. And then I, well, hopefully not 12, hopefully mm -hmm. there's still 10 in each, yeah. but there could be varying number of assets. So like the circuit needs to be able to handle some kind of degree of variability, right? Right, and so this might make the circuit uh, extra complicated because now you have to sort of keep track of how many different asset types. You have to keep a running sum of each different asset type. And it's not the most efficient way to do it. And there was uh, a reason why um, with the Zcash sapling upgrade, uh, they stopped doing this and they adopted a, um, a much more clever way, um, much more clever way of uh, doing it, which uh, I'll call homomorphic value commitments. And could you explain a little bit more about what exactly are homomorphic value commitments? Exactly. So the idea is that instead of um, Instead of having all of your uh, input notes, so if you have value, public key, and then asset type, so suppose that you have four uh, notes that are being spent, and then you have four notes that are being created. So instead of having one circuit that takes in all uh, of these notes and checks the sums independently. 
Instead, what we do is we associate with each of these nodes a value commitment. And what is a value commitment? Basically, uh, we can think of it as an encrypted representation of the note's value. So it's kind of an object that commits to a value, but it is done in such a way where you cannot tell what the actual value is. Right. The important properties of it is that it's hiding, meaning no one can tell what the value is, that it's binding, that it represents exactly one value and it cannot be, cannot be feasibly changed, and that it's homomorphic. which means that if you take um, two value commitments and add them together, that that is going to be equal to the commitment that is the sum of the values. Okay. So, um, so if you take, and I won't say exactly how you add uh, just yet, but if you take uh, two value commitments and you add them together, this is going to be equal to uh, the value commitment of the sum of its uh, values inside. Makes sense. Okay. So, so basically with this trick, uh, you know, we had this number two or, or number three item where we would check the sum of inputs is equal to sum outputs in the circuit. We no longer need to do this in a circuit. Am I right? Exactly. Yeah. The reason that you want to do this is because instead of checking in the circuit that uh, the sum of the value commitments is, is uh, zero, uh, you can instead just have um, one circuit for each uh, note. So um, perhaps one for each spent, at least in the sapling uh, model, this was the way it worked. You have one circuit for each note and the circuit just needs to check that the value commitment is correct. The, uh, the, the value commitment matches the value of the note. And the circuit doesn't actually know anything about all the other notes. It's not checking the balance directly. But instead, outside of the circuit, we can add up all of the uh, um, value commitments uh, that are being spent and we can add up all of the value commitments that are created, and we can check that that is uh, the commitment of the value zero. And so from the outside, we see that it balances because the sum is zero, but we don't actually uh, know what is inside of each of these value commitments. Makes sense. And there's some advantages of this. Basically, each circuit is now much smaller. You're not constrained to, say, having two notes in and two notes out and uh, generally you just get a lot more uh, efficiency. Uh, and I think especially in the multi-asset context, like this bucketization by asset is much easier to do outside of the circuit than it is inside the circuit, I'm guessing, so. Uh, right, Yeah. and the amazing thing now is that because each circuit only uh, deals with one node at a time, this means that the circuit only needs to consider one asset at a time. But I guess now you need to make this uh, commitment somehow unique to each asset type, am I right? So like you can't add them to different value commitments from two different assets uh, or it wouldn't, somehow shouldn't make sense. Am exactly. So let's look at how it uh, works in the single asset case and then I'll describe how it okay. generalizes. So in the single asset case, we get uh, two uh, random, I'll put random in quotes, uh, elliptic curve points. Uh, this is where it gets mathy, right? Uh, we'll call these points V and R. And so what we can do is we can say that um, a value commitment for some uh, integer value 
and some uh, randomness. And the randomness is going to serve uh, to, to make the value commitment private. The value commitment is going to be equal to the integer value times the elliptic curve point V plus the randomness times the elliptic curve point R. And the nice thing about uh, using this uh, form of value commitment, um, which is uh, essentially a Pedersen uh, commitment, is that it meets the requirements that we have. It's um, hiding, binding, and homomorphic, at least um, to the extent that we need it to be. Uh, um, as, as, if you had two different Vs and R, well, I guess if you had two different, uh, another asset, you would add them together and they just uh, add up in terms of the V and well, let's say you had a U or something like that. It right. would be uh, the same. Okay. Because if you have V1 plus the value commitment, um, V2 and some randomness, this is going to be equal to V1 plus V2 times V plus some randomness plus some other randomness times R, which is just the value commitment of V1 plus V2 and some randomness. Yep. So we get the properties that we want. And uh, in the single asset case, we just check that the sum of all the value commitments is zero and um, we, we uh, have, have guaranteed that the transaction is balanced. So what do we do uh, in the multi-asset case? Well, there's a very um, uh, clever uh, uh, approach that uh, the Zcash team uh, at Electric Coin Company figured out, which is that um, instead of using two points we actually have many uh, random elliptic curve points. Okay. One for each asset type. That is to say that each uh, separate asset type is going to have its own random elliptic curve point. Okay. But R is the same for all, right? Uh, R can be the same for all. Okay. And this way, when you uh, now uh, change your value commitment to take in uh, V, the asset type, and the randomness. Instead of uh, using the single asset value base, we use the particular value base for that asset type. And then the claim is that because if we um, now add value commitments from two different assets together, so for example, so value commitment of V1, um, and then let's say asset type one, and then the randomness is uh, not important, plus the value commitment of uh, that has value V2 and asset type uh, A2 and some randomness, then this is going to look like V1 and then uh, the elliptic curve point for the asset type 1 plus V2 times the elliptic curve point for asset type 2 and then randomness. And the claim is that because uh, VA1 and VA2 are uh, random, that it's not actually feasible to, to determine um, what uh, the relationship between uh, VA1 and VA2 is. So they, they will never collide in such a way where you know, they can cancel each other out or something like that. Right, because even, if, even though they're um, on the same elliptic curve and, and more formally in, in the same uh, 
subgroup, same cyclic subgroup on the elliptic curve. Uh, so even though we know that there's some potential relationship between them, because they were selected at random, uh, it's not feasible to find this relationship. Yep. And this is a very standard cryptographic assumption. Yep, makes sense. Now, uh, the only uh, thing that we have to do is that um, we should say that, well, uh, randomness is kind of hard to verify. So we're going to actually just use uh, pseudo-random points, which are generated um, using a uh, hash to curve. What, what do you hash in this case? Right, exactly. So, in order to find uh, the value base um, for a particular asset, we want to make sure that um, it's pseudo-randomly chosen. It's, there's no, no structure to it, uh, no obvious structure to it. Um, and that it's unique to that asset type, that no other asset type has this particular value base. And so we're going to uh, use this uh, um, hash to curve, uh, there, there's many uh, possible ways to do it, of the asset type representation. An asset type representation, is it like a string that has an asset name or is it something else? It, um, it could be uh, um, a, a token address, for example. It could be some kind of other representative uh, string. The important thing is that it just has to be unique to that asset type. Makes sense. And, and two uh, distinct assets never share the same uh, representation. And so by using this uh, uh, hash to curve, we can get um, these uh, value bases for each asset type. And in fact, um, we can generate new value bases um, uh, whenever the protocol needs it. And so this starts to meet our requirement of uh, not hard coding into the protocol, uh, the assets um, that, that are allowed to go in the pool. Uh, and if new assets come along, we just hash uh, whatever their representation is and we can get the new value base. Makes sense. Okay, so I think I understand how kind of the uh, assets work, but how do you create new assets? I mean, usually for native assets, frequently you would have some kind of like, uh, you know, either cap or schedule of how they appear and things like that. So when we want to create in the multi-asset world a new asset, we probably need to set some sort of parameters from uh, the get-go and maybe restrict who can create assets and things like that. So what are, what are the kind of challenges or some, and solutions are in uh, regard to creating new assets? Right. So uh, since most uh, assets probably come from other chains, so uh, you, you, you would want to have some kind of bridge um, to whatever chain the, the multi-asset shielded pool is on. And so when you bridge the assets, um, uh, and, and this is sort of independent of the shielded pool, you want to have that representation of each, uh, of each asset. And then uh, you can either make it uh, um, uh, the shielded pool um, perhaps permissioned, you need some kind of permission to add uh, a new asset, or you can make it permissionless, where as long as your uh, asset type is unique and has a unique representation, it doesn't actually harm uh, the other assets in the pool. Um, you just need to make sure that when um, this new asset is deposited in the pool, that um, the new value base is created. And then um, when you're adding um, uh, 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 the new assets to the pool, then your value commitment, so recalling the uh, um, when you had the uh, sum of the transaction, uh, all of the value commitments in a transaction, and we said, well, um, the sum of um, all the value commitments um, of the notes uh, being spent is equal to the sum of the value commitment of the notes. Uh, being created, when you are actively adding um, assets to the pool, then instead of enforcing this equality, you're going to have um, 
the value commitment of the assets that are added plus the value commitment of the um, uh, assets that are being spent, and that should be uh, equal to the output uh, notes that are created. And uh, when you're uh, taking assets out, you just move this to the other set. Got it. Okay, and I guess the same could work for, like, not only for bridged assets, but if you have like a chain that creates assets, assets natively, the, the assets could be created outside of the shielded pool and, and moved into the shielded pool, and the logic for how you create and all of that stuff could live outside of the shielded pool. Right. Unfortunately, uh, right now, um, essentially, because uh, assets will generally come from another chain, uh, you have to have a transparent bridge. Okay. So whether it's like an Ethereum bridge or a Cosmos IBC or something like that, um, this is all transparent. Um, uh, the addresses, the values, the particular assets that are involved um, um, is all visible uh, from the outside and cryptographically linked. And um, what would be really nice is to be able to have a shielded or private bridge where uh, assets that are in a shielded pool on one chain uh, can be bridged to a shielded pool on, on another chain. However, this is a, a very uh, complex problem uh, because uh, um, you know, already bridging between chains is already kind of a difficult thing. Um, um, but when you have a shielded or private bridge, um, now you have to uh, deal with the different trust models on different chains, and it's uh, a whole uh, research yeah. um, field. And, and you probably want to have like, the assets to be exactly the same, like if you're using your elliptic curve representation as you described, like for elliptic curve points for kind of encoding assets, the same thing has to happen on the other side, otherwise it doesn't work, quite work like that, right? Right, if, yeah. if, um, if you're thinking about um, not just a different trust model between different chains, but like actual different technical specifications, yeah. different token standards, and now you're trying to bridge across chains, uh, is, it, um, it's a it very comfortable question. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about like just simple transfers, but is there anything beyond simple transfers like within the multi-asset shielded pool? Like, can we do something more than that? Absolutely. So, um, of course, as soon as you have multiple asset types, uh, the, the uh, kinds of applications that people would want to do are, are um, much more complex and much more varied. And so um, some of the uh, things that you might want to do are, uh, for example, general computation. So um, if we think about uh, um, like Ethereum and uh, smart contracts on Ethereum and other kinds of um, general purpose computation where uh, you can program um, uh, into your tokens uh, lots of interesting functionality that can be unique for each token. Um, you might want to do the same thing inside of a shielded pool. Um, there's a paper called Zexy about this, which is very interesting. Um, and um, they describe how uh, you, you might have different token uh, types inside of um, uh, the same pool with this kind of custom uh, computation. Um, but this is a very, very general approach and the uh, generality is sometimes uh, computationally expensive. Um, and so there's some trade-offs, but uh, certainly uh, something very exciting that you would want to do is just the same kind of, of computation and programmability yeah. that you have on, um, with a transparent uh, 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 tokens. Then um, the other things you might want to do uh, is you might want to have a shielded DEX, and there's uh, projects that are working on this as well, um, with the idea that uh, if you want to do a swap inside of your shielded pool, you don't want to have to with, you know, uh, uh, unshield your tokens to a transparent address, do the swap, and then shield them again because you yeah. have some loss of privacy. And so if you uh, build your DEX sort of natively to uh, work within the shielded pool, then this is much better. Um, and and there's a whole, it's a whole interesting problem, again, by itself. So... Um, Another thing that you might want to do is you might want to have uh, rewards or incentives 
inside of um, a shielded pool. Um, this could take um, the form of, of, of many different things. Um, maybe you uh, just want to have some kind of airdrop inside of a shielded pool, or you want to, um, um, you know, perhaps over time uh, uh, provide some kind of incentive to certain tokens in the pool, or maybe you even want to do something like a shielded staking where there's staking rewards, or you just somehow want to have more than just a static uh, amounts of token. And the challenge of this, of course, is that um, because you don't actually know uh, where all of the tokens are in the shielded pool, like how, how could you do an airdrop or something, right? Um, and, uh, and, and so, um, of course, the, the way to approach this is to say, well, we need to have a little bit more programmability in the shielded pool where, um, where we do allow uh, some kind of uh, rewards claiming or airdrop claiming uh, process to happen. So that even though um, uh, perhaps from the external world, if someone uh, provides rewards, um, they might not know uh, exactly where they're going because uh, the, the shielded yep. pool obscures this, but uh, each uh, user uh, might see that they're eligible and they can prove that they're eligible in zero knowledge and yep. uh, um, either claim their reward or airdrop or something like that. When we want to ask this question of uh, how do you provide rewards or incentives or, or otherwise um, just allowing people to somehow um, claim or change their tokens inside of the shielded pool, um, this is actually not impossible. So if we recall, um, the reason that tokens are not fungible, so if you have uh, two asset types, uh, A1 and A2, and um, we, if we put as a, a hard goal for a shielded pool that um, you uh, sum all of the values across different asset types independently. So um, the amount of A1 never affects the amount of A2. And, and this guarantees that these two token uh, types are, are not fungible with each other. But if we wanted to do something inside of the pool um, where uh, um, actually there was um, some kind of difference between these two, but we still wanted this uh, fungibility. So like um, asset one and asset two maybe represent the same token type. Uh, transparently. But encode uh, some metadata. For example, reward claimed or not. So, uh, for example, um, maybe uh, A1 is uh, um, you know, uh, some token type that may be the native token of the chain, and then uh, A2 is going to represent the same token type uh, outside of the shielded pool but inside of the shielded pool, they're going to um, be distinguished because maybe one has uh, um, some rewards that has yet to be claimed and this uh, um, token type represents that the reward has already been claimed. Okay, and so then we want uh, limited fungibility. meaning that we want to be able to uh, sort of mix these token types and allow their values to, uh, to interact, but we don't want to break the, uh, other than the limited fungibility that we add, we don't want to break the constraint that otherwise asset types value independently. Okay, so how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, the way that we do that is that uh, if we have the value bases VA1, and VA2, instead of um, insisting that uh, value bases always have to be um, uh, derived by uh, this uh, hash to curve, uh -huh. so value, uh, the value base for asset A1 was uh, derived from um, this hash to curve, and this was derived by uh, 
another has to, has to curve. Instead, what we can do is we can um, introduce a new kind of value base, which is not uh, created by a hash to curve, but maybe is something like A1 to A2. And it's going to be uh, a combination of um, these two value bases. Mm -hmm. So uh, we might have minus one of VA1 plus plus one VA2. And this is going to be an entirely new asset type, not one that came from outside of the shielded pool, right. but it's something that kind of only exists inside the shielded pool. And the amazing thing is that this asset type allows you to convert one unit of asset one to one unit of asset two. Interesting. And the beauty of it is that uh, it's because if you uh, took one unit of uh, asset one and combined it with one unit of this, uh, I'll call it magic asset, then the value uh, balance, the value commitment of this sum would be, magically yeah. turns into one unit of asset two. Very cool. Yeah. And so uh, as long as you're uh, kind of careful <laughs> and how you uh, allow these kinds of uh, magic assets to be constructed, you can allow uh, asset one to be converted into asset two. And you can uh, implement uh, some kind of rewards or something by saying, well, maybe you imagine now you have uh, uh, some asset three that you want, uh, um, want to uh, give to everyone that holds asset one. Well, you just have to change uh, the magic asset type, instead of uh, just saying convert A1 to A2, maybe it's, you call it claim reward. And every time that you uh, um, convert uh, asset type one to asset type two, you get one of asset type three as well. And so uh, you're converting asset type one into one of asset type two and one of asset type three. I see. And so now you've given uh, people inside of, or users inside of the shielded pool this ability to sort of um, modify this metadata of their, their asset in a controlled way uh, such that um, uh, previously it represented one thing and now it represents something else. And as long as, um, like I said, you're careful in how you uh, um, allow these uh, very limited uh, conversions, you can um, uh, encode kind of the simple uh, token operations that you might want to do other than uh, like a simple transfer. And you can do this without having a full pro programmability um, which is which is more expensive. You can do yep. all of this inside of the homomorphic value commitment, which is uh, very efficient. And some of the examples we mentioned, airdrops, rewards. Is there mm -hmm. are there other use cases uh, that are kind of you can do the same way? Uh, right. Um, uh, well, certainly, if um, um, perhaps uh, some of these asset types encode uh, NFTs. Uh, or something like that. Maybe, uh, maybe you want to, uh, under certain circumstances, allow some uh, NFT to be minted. Um, this NFT maybe is a, uh, representing um, uh, that there was some uh, uh, holding at some particular point in time of, of asset one um, that you want to, to uh, represent. Um, and so, um, if, if, if you want to um, um, yeah, if, if you want to uh, encode um, you know almost arbitrary metadata in, in these asset types, although you, you don't really get generalized computation, you can still get something that um, can, can do a lot of things. By the way, so you mentioned NFTs, uh, mm -hmm. and one thing that I forgot to ask when you were explaining asset types is, uh, for NFTs, would 
every NFT have a different asset base, or is there a way to combine them together and to you know like put some NFTs under the same asset base, or it doesn't make sense? Right. So the interesting thing is that when you have an NFT, then your uh, you know your value of an NFT note, well, value just more or less doesn't make sense, right? It's kind of always equal to one. So this means that you're encoding all info in the value base. Okay. So this does mean that, uh, for example, um, um, it's not just kind of the type of NFT, but like all of the data as well somehow goes into this value base, um, or, or at least it's represented by this value base. And this does mean that um, when you're choosing the, the representations of each asset type and the representation of what an NFT looks like, that you have to make sure that all of the information um, is, is encoded um, properly in order to make sure that NFTs of uh, similar type but different data don't get mixed together. Makes sense, makes sense. All right, this was super interesting. Thank you so much for uh, coming on the show and doing this recording. Thank you for having me. Great.